All right, good afternoon, everyone. We are thrilled to have you with us today. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Ghislaine Gunu, the interim president and CEO of the Nellie Mae Education Foundation. If you are new to Nellie Mae, we are a philanthropic organization focused on advancing racial equity in public education in the New England region. We envision a world where all youth have access to an excellent and equitable public education that prepares them to succeed and thrive in community. Today, we are so honored to welcome three amazing panelists, Dr. Deborah Jewel Sherman, Dr. Sonia Douglas Horsford, and Dr. Warren Simmons. In addition to our moderator, Dr. Keith Catone, Executive Director of the Center for Youth and Community Leadership in Education. The COVID-19 global health pandemic laid bare so many inequities and injustices, including in our public education system. In many ways, we were forced to rethink how and when teaching and learning happens for the millions of children and youth across the region and nation, and to organize resources, policies, and processes accordingly. This is in great part due to the rightful calls to not return to an old normal that quite frankly never really worked for most, especially not kids in communities of color and under-resourced schools and neighborhoods. We now find ourselves today at the beginning of a school year unlike any other, where most educators and students have returned to in-person learning for the first time in 18 months. They, along with families, are facing some serious and pressing challenges that deserve all of our attention. We also know that this can be a time to reimagine what public education can look like moving forward. As an example, we know from conversations that we've been a part of at Nellie Mae that educators and young people are calling for us to reimagine the sorts of supports, such as mental health and wraparound services that can make our schools and learning environments work for all. Decades of education reform practices have shown us some promising efforts to close opportunity gaps. We know that we've also made some mistakes because stark inequities still exist for many of our young people, especially our black and brown youth. In the intro to her book, The Purpose of Power, Alisa Garza poses a simple yet profound question. How do we make new mistakes and learn new lessons rather than continue to repeat the same mistakes and be disillusioned to learn that they merely produce the same results? In today's conversation, we'll learn how we can apply the lessons of the past to the present, considering what has worked or yielded promise and what has not, with the intention of advancing a more equitable and racially just future for all of us and primarily for our children and youth. Thank you again for joining us and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Keith Katon. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, welcome everyone out there on, in Zoom world, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, our panelists are actually joining us from international context. And so uh, welcome everybody from every time zone possible right now. Uh, thanks for taking this hour of your day. We don't take it for granted and, and hope to um, just uh, to have a great conversation that offers some insights and, and, and provoke some thinking for us as, as we move into the future by looking at our past. So I'm going to start with a couple of housekeeping things uh, and then uh, formally introduce our panelists and then we'll launch into a conversation. So the housekeeping things are you can use the chat uh, in the Q&A function to submit questions. Uh, our friends at Nellie May are looking at that and trying to pull themes for uh, later in the conversation if we have time to explore things that are coming from the, the audience. And uh, if you are on social media, please use Ed Equity Talks, hashtag Ed Equity Talks. I'll throw that in the chat uh, to share insights uh, from this conversation on social media, wherever you are. Uh, whatever platforms you're, you might be using. So let me jump into who we've got with us. So first, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Deborah Jules Sherman, who is the Gregory R. Arnrig, Anrig 
uh, professor of practice and educational leadership at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She is the first woman professor of practice at HGSE. And prior to becoming faculty at Harvard, Dr. Jules Sherman was superintendent of schools in Richmond, Virginia, and was recognized as the 2008 Virginia Superintendent of the Year. Before becoming a superintendent, Dr. Jules Sherman was a teacher, school principal, and held several central office leadership positions. So ran the gamut uh, in the field of education in all contexts, adult ed even, uh, if, we, if we reach back. And uh, is currently also serving as a member of the board for Nellie May Education Foundation. I'm also excited to be in conversation today with Dr. Sonia Douglas Horsford, who serves as the Professor of Education, Education Leadership at Teachers College in Columbia University. And since 2016, Dr. Horsford has served as the co-director of the Urban Education Leadership Leaders Program at TC, and in 2017, founded the Black Education Research Collective, which you'll hear more about today, to convene scholars devoted to conducting, translating, and disseminating research that leads to improved educational opportunities, experiences, and outcomes for Black children and youth. Prior to her time at TC, Dr. Horsford held faculty positions at UNLV, that's the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, for those of you who don't know that acronym, and George Mason University, and has an extensive list of publications, including a recent book entitled The Politics of Education Policy in an Era of Inequality, Possibilities for Democratic Schooling, which she wrote with Janelle Scott and Gary Anderson. Finally, um, we have Dr. Warren Simmons, who I had the pleasure of working for for a number of years, uh, and has held an array of important roles in the field of education over the years, currently serves as a senior policy advisor for the National Education Policy Center at the University of Colorado Boulder, but earlier in his career held, had he founded the Philadelphia Education Fund, after which he served as executive director for the Annenberg Institute for School Reform at Brown University for 18 years. Uh, and Dr. Simmons has a record of nonprofit and corporate board service across the field, spanning local, national, and international contexts, including his current position as a board member for Nellie May Education Foundation. So we've got a rich uh, treasure trove of expertise and perspective to explore together today uh, among our panelists. And I'm going to just launch into uh, the first question. So whenever someone talks to me about learning from our past, one of the things that comes into my head in my storytelling is back when I was in graduate school in the, in, or undergraduate school rather in the late nineties, I remember wondering if the conversations we were having in my classes about school reform it, it resembled what other people were talking about a decade earlier, a couple decades before. And then when I taught an undergraduate class, you know, a couple decades later, uh, I was faced with the reality that the conversations we were having in that academic space um, were eerily similar to those from 15, 20 years before. And so, you know, I always wonder, are we just talking about the same things? Are we regurgitating the same problems? Are we just exploring the same themes over and over? Um, and, and not everything about that reality is necessarily negative, but I feel a little bit concerned with whether or not things have changed over the years uh, when it comes to affecting educational equity and racial justice in our schools. And so one of the questions that I wanted to pose to start us off in, in light of the theme of today's conversation is in your view and in your experience, how has the conversation about educational equity and reform changed over the years and how has it stayed the same? Um, and what might we learn from those shifts or from the stagnancy. And uh, in our sort of pre-panel conversation, I, I know Dr. Simmons had had a response to, to this question and we'll sort of start there and, and, and move forward. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. And, and uh, henceforward, you can just call me Warren, call me doctor repeatedly. It makes me feel much more positive about myself than I probably deserve to. Uh, so, so let me say this, the first thing I would say is that there isn't, there hasn't been a unitary monolithic conversation about education reform. Um, the resume that you just, dis you described me uh, as being actually didn't reflect my experience at, at local levels. 
I worked as a special assistant in Prince George's County Public Schools. The Philadelphia Education Fund supported education reform in Philadelphia. I've done local efforts, but I've also been part of national conversations. So what I found is that the national conversation changes every five or six years uh, as a result of rival disciplines seeking supremacy from social psychologists and psychologists to more recently uh, economists. What economists know about education reform, I don't know, but they've managed to uh, be very primary. And so I've seen in since 1990, the national policy making agenda shift from standard assessment accountability to more data systems, to human capital, to conversations about school governance, whether it should be appointed, elected, or mayor controls, to privatization, to research-based school designs, to small schools, to small learning communities, uh, et cetera. Uh, working locally, I've seen a remarkably consistent uh, conversation. In 1990, I supported the Black Male Achievement uh, Committee in Prince George's County Public Schools. And if you looked at the list of recommendations, it was about multicultural education, education diversity, strengthening core access to the core curriculum. Uh, if you shift to look at the recommendations for the PS 2013 campaign in New York City, uh, led by a coalition of, 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 of youth and, and adult organizing groups. Again, an emphasis on well-rounded curriculum, multicultural education, arts integration, support for students and, and families, community schools, et cetera. Black and Latino males in Boston, uh, same emphasis. Uh, 2015, culturally responsive curriculum, assets-based approach to dealing with students of color, strengthening family and community engagement. And so, uh, I think the, the rapid shifts uh, in education reform strategies and theories occurs at the national level. But when you engage parents and community groups at the local level, there's a remarkable consistency in what these groups have been asking for for over 30 years. More resources, uh, more diversity in, in the educators, uh, curriculum that affects the students and families, more families and, and student support. And so uh, the last thing I'll say is that the national conversation often proceeds as if reform is simply a technical matter and that the only thing that needs to change are schools. Uh, what you begin to see increasingly at the local level is a recognition that reform is not just a technical endeavor, but it involves a political, social, and cultural change as well. Uh, and that systems need to change along with what goes on in classrooms, schools, and families and communities. I will stop there. Thank you, Warren. And so you you talked uh, extensively there in the, in the last half about what we learn when we listen to communities, when we listen to people on the ground about what they're looking for from their schools. And I know um, the Black Education Research Collaborative, or BERC, um, that, that Dr. Horsford uh, leads is it just released a report with information fresh from the field, um, from the ground, uh, uh, in terms of perspectives from Black communities about what they're looking for in their schools and from their education. And so um, just drop the link to Burke where you can get a copy of that report. Uh, and I would invite Sonia to, to share um, you know, the ways in which what Warren just said resonates with what you heard um, or, or how it might differ. Thank you, Keith, um, and thank you to Dr. Ganu and the Nellie May Foundation for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. I'm really honored to be here with Dr. Simmons and Dr. Jewel Sherman as well, um, because I think the work that they've done, been able to do within systems at every level um, uh, is really important to the lessons that we can learn in terms of shaping and informing the work that we do going forward, uh, which is complex and difficult work, but we don't have to start from scratch. I think we certainly have models that we can build um, upon. Um, as Keith mentioned, the Black Education Research Collective uh, conducted a study because we recognize how important empirical research is to shaping the policy conversation. So in January, we, we went into the field and began collecting data. We conducted seven or 440 surveys, um, as well as a series of focus groups in communities across the country uh, to really hear directly from Black students, parents, grandparents, coaches, educators, uh, and community leaders about how COVID-19 has impacted Black education um, in terms of their own experience. Um, and secondly, what policymakers and leaders should do about it. Um, and so our approach, I think, was distinct because we really wanted to build upon the tradition of community-engaged scholarship, similar to the work that I know Dr. Simmons um, did for many years at Annenberg, where we are looking to hear directly from communities to use that information to inform um, our policy recommendations and future research um, and studies. And so what we found echoes what Dr. Simmons said in that 
um, the, the communities and the individuals that we spoke with um, thought it was very important that we protect and defend the rights of Black students to achieve an equitable um, and adequate education in state safe learning and welcoming environments. And that in fact, COVID-19 and increased racial violence has had a disproportionate impact on our communities. Um, and that this is gonna require some really targeted investments in counseling, men mental health and psychological services and supports in providing professional development to teachers to ensure that they are equipped um, to deliver a curriculum um, and use an approach that is effective in educating Black students and students of color uh, to make sure that we are investing in the identification and preparation of the teacher workforce, uh, which is incredibly important and in the research all points us to the significance of the teacher and leader in schools. And also to restore and rebuild community trust between uh, communities and the schools and districts that serve them. And so the crises that we're currently um, continuing to experience given, and I, we call, we refer to them as the triple pandemics, tri, I'm sorry, triple pandemics of COVID-19, it's economic recession, right? Because the economic implications of that are really significant when it comes to thinking about how it's affected black communities. Um, and then lastly, you know, just the visible outward acts of racial violence um, and the fact that our children are being targeted as part of this process. So we've heard from the community um, and we're not surprised necessarily, although it is stunning to see this much consistency uh, in terms of responses and desires for educational improvements um, across the, the country. And so now we see our work as being um, thinking about how we're strategic and really advancing these recommendations um, and mobilizing the research that we now have, um, building upon what we already knew, um, and making uh, the connections that we, we need to make to advance this agenda uh, at the local level. And while also informing the national conversation, because we recognize that um, you know, both of these things are really important for us to, to engage in. So we're excited about the work that's underway. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest, I think, across the board um, among stakeholders um, to have a conversation about what's being taught. <laughs> There's very different opinions about that, but um, this is the time for us to really be very clear about um, what we think is important to teach uh, as, as it relates to curriculum, as it relates to pedagogy and assessment. Um, and so we see it as a both and, and that we're really building upon the work that's been uh, laid before us and using the energy um, and the passion and the concerns of the youth to really drive an agenda for change. Thank you, Sonia. The, the, the report that um, Burke put out is framed largely in this, this context of, uh, of COVID and, and also sort of coming out of the, the rec racial reckoning that we're, we're continuing to, to do as a country and deal with as a country. Um, and another piece of that context, right, is that we have the American uh, Recovery Plan, uh, Rescue Plan rather, and the, and the ESSER funds, right, the Elementary Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds, which are pushing millions, billions really uh, across the country into local districts. And Dr. Jules Sherman, your career was, mm -hmm. is built on that, that local work, right? Doing work directly in schools at local level with districts, right? That, that in, until, until your time at Harvard, that's where you were and, and, mm -hmm. and leading in that context. And so I'm curious because the, what the ESSER funds are doing um, the mechanisms for how the, the decisions being made for how those funds get used are being pushed into the district level, right? This is very localized decision making for what is really potentially a once in a generation opportunity to make significant change to the ways that we do school. So I'm curious from your perspective, especially in the spirit of the title of the session, uh, in terms of learning from the past, what we can do to inform our mm -hmm. future, what what do you see as, as opportunity right now based on what you know from, from all the work that you've, you've been part of over the years? Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And please call me Deborah, or as the students do, DJS. Um, I have to acknowledge that when I first got to Harvard, Keith was my teaching fellow and really helped me get situated there. I'm always grateful to you for that, and it's good to see you. Um, and Warren, I uh, found profound your opening remarks that situated us and, um, you know, gave us a perspective of where we've been and some of the challenges that we have, you know, found inherent. Sonia, I applaud so much the work that you have going forward uh, that you've put in motion that will help us as we go forward. As I think about 
both of those perspectives and the, um, the opportunity, Keith, that you just talked about that we have, I'm very, very mindful that we, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity, but there are mistakes that we have historically made. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think that, yes, it appears that the issues keep resurfacing, but that's because we've never stayed the course. So as I think about this new funding, there are three S's that I've come up with. Number one, we have to make sure that we don't simplify these really complex issues. As a nation in public education, we're very, very good at that. Um, we want a silver bullet. We want something that's quick and easy. We're not willing to look at the root entanglements and the other issues that over time have compounded and led us to where we are. So oversimplification of complex problems is, a, um, is, is going to have us looking at these same issues 10, 20 years from now. Another S that I think that we need to keep um, in mind as we're thinking about how the monies are spent is that the systems currently have been, continue to be set up to get the results that we're getting. And so if you continue um, trying to put new programs in a, in a system that is hell-bent on destroying families, the lives of children, and precluding just opportunities for them to be successful, we're not going to get a different result. Um, and so it's not enough for districts and states to be thinking programmatically. I think that they really need to look at the systems that are undergirding the way that we're doing what it is that we're doing and change those in addition to programs so that we have results. And then the third S that I thought of, just trying to make it easy um, to remember is staying the course. I think that one of the reasons that we have cycles of these issues is that we have in America a very short attention span. It's like we have this much of a window of opportunity to push through reform, to be able to grab the nation's attention and help them to see um, that these are evils, that these are things that have to be corrected. You know, we see it with COVID, we see, saw it with all of these horrendous atrocities um, uh, that were so public, like Mr. George Floyd, but the attention span of our country, um, not just for uh, white people, but even those of us who are people of color, tends to be very, very short. And so how are we going to not grow weary in well-doing and realize that we have to stay on this? So when I hear Sonia talking about the research that she's doing, that's giving us the tools that we need, information that we need to set forth a long-term strategy instead of something that we think that we can do quick and dirty. So not oversimplifying, recognizing that these are systemic issues, not just programmatic, um, and then that we have to be willing to stay the course and we have to come up with political strategies to make people stay in the fight and not grow weary. So, I'm wondering if we can collectively take a stab at what that could look like and, and run with that framework for a minute, these three S's, right? So we have don't oversimplify, systemic solutions, and staying the course. Because one of the things, Deborah, when, when you said stay the course, my immediate question was, well, stay the course with what? Right? Like what what are we gonna stay? What what is worth staying the course on, you know, with? Uh, or what course are we gonna stay on? And so I'm wondering just uh, uh, from hearing that reflection, um, and if any of you, you know, want to offer up, what are the things that we want to, you know, set a course for and, and stick with it, um, specifically in drawing on what we know, um, what we've learned, and what's worked, what hasn't, what, what, what have we abandoned that we should go back to? What have we not tried that no one's ever had the political will for? Um, you know, what are those, what are those things that come to mind? So let me um, correct myself earlier, because um, it's important to the three S's conversation, which is actually very brilliant, uh, Deborah. And in all the years I've known you, I've never called you brilliant. So let the record show that I'm calling you brilliant right now. Um, at the national, the national level, actually, that, that conversation has been political, although they hide the fact that it's political. That is to say that what people do nationally, um, and I'm talking about the people who are part of think tanks uh, that inform government, uh, the realization is, you know, a president has maybe 
two years. Like, right, we were already talking about Joe Biden being a success or failure, and he hasn't been in office a year, right? And so there's this rush to get reforms done and completed within a political cycle. Um, the governors have them, state legislators have them, and, and at the national level, people are operating to get things done, passed, you know, funded, uh, informed in a political cycle of two years. When you work locally, and particularly when you work with community leadership, there's an understanding that the community is gonna be there. Mayors come and go, superintendents come and go, governors come and go. The community is there to sustain itself. And they think, it, and communities think intergenerationally. So, so one of the things that we need to do to stay the course is to shift from this national top down, which focuses on governors and presidents and congressmen and senators and the two to three year time frame that they operate on to the time frame of communities who are going to be at this work for decades and inter intergenerationally. And so I think this new shift to being much more community centered, as Nellie May has done, uh, will strengthen that third S of staying the course to make it less dependent on a mayor, a city council, and, and a, a governor. And then secondly, uh, the, uh, the other thing that happens when you deal with communities is the issue of systems and culture are at the forefront. Uh, and these other technical programmatic matters are received to the background and support of that. And, and so I'm hopeful that as we reemphasize and center on communities, uh, that that will focus, enhance focus on systems and enhance focus on staying the course. The last thing I'll say is to be careful about how we characterize systems uh, because progressives have reinforced the narrative of conservatives when we attack systems, right? That plays into the progressive, I mean, the, the conservative argument that systems need to be broken down, need to be eliminated, need to be privatized, right? I think what I hear parents say is, is that we don't need to eliminate systems, we need to strengthen them and design them to serve communities. And that's a very different point from how conservatives uh, use our critique of systems to justify dismantling and creating alternatives or privatizing systems. Very well said, um, um, Warren, and not because you said that I was, I was brilliant. But um, I was thinking about things that we want to stay the course on. Um, you know, everyone is talking now about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And those issues, it's not that they're new. We've certainly, you know, I, I was a, a young professional or a, or a college student when we had affirmative action, which lasted, what, Warren, like nine years? Um, no, I mean, it, staying the course is a, a real issue. So what are issues such as diversity, the, the push that we see for diversity, um, equity, and inclusion in, in all matters of public education? What do we have to put in place so that that's not a fad, so that that's not a way of thinking that has its moment in the sun and then we go on to, to something else? Um, strategy, uh, there have been lots of... Um, there's lots of research that talks about the dangers of zero tolerance of um, that kind of punitive educational environment uh, that just feeds the um, um, you know, school to prison pipeline. What ways are we going to ensure that the focus stays on that so that we truly mitigate the number of million dollar blocks that we have in places like Chicago, you know, that beautiful, that phenomenal study that was done again at Columbia um, that pointed out how much money communities and state and local governments are funneling into incarceration and into, um, which has an effect on public education in a profound way. I mean, we're going to get funding that we can use to, to, to that'll really help with the day-to-day -day implementation of teaching and learning. But the ecosystem in which our students are educated is so much more complex than that and um, will require partnerships. So that was the third piece that I'm hoping that we will uh, continue to focus on. We've gotten better, Nellie May is at the forefront of doing this, partnering with entities in better service of community. And I think that that's a critical element that we're going to have to um, ramp up so that we can indeed stay the course and change systems. 
Sonia, the work that you're doing at Columbia just gladdens my heart and encourages me so much. Thank you, Professor. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, I just think there's a lot more learning that we can even do. Those of us who want to be a part of these efforts that um, a lot of it requires an understanding of our history as well. <laughs> We're having these debates about critical race theory and the importance of historical context. I do think that um, some of the current movements are disconnected from the civil rights tradition, from the tradition of African-American organizing, um, and that there is much to learn just from those strategies, um, the wins and the losses um, in terms of how you work within systems. And I think that, um, you know, Dr. Simmons' point about how we view systems is really critical. As someone who works to prepare uh, district level leaders <laughs> or works in those spaces with agencies and government institutions, you know, I think that we have lost um, an appreciation for the gift of administration in many ways that, um, you know, we can have a value and a passion and, and, and things that we want to do, but there is, you know, we have to focus on the how and understanding how to navigate systems, have an appreciation for administration, not as something that is simply a bureaucracy um, or seemingly unnecessary, but as how you engage um, the wills of a democracy. <laughs> and so I think political education, understanding how the political process works, the importance of engaging in that at every level um, and educating ourselves starting within to really understand what we know about this fight um, and how we can better equip ourselves within the context that we're in is critically important. And so as educators, I know many of us uh, may not be as interested in, in dealing with um, you know, some of the, the difficulties and complexities associated with the political process, with administrative functions um, and structures and systems. But, you know, I guess I'm more of the mind of learning how you are able to navigate those systems to build power uh, for communities and able to create the type of schools and, and districts and communities that you want to see. Uh, I wrote in the chat, preach. Uh, <laughs> because you were singing from my from my hymnal, um, you know, I've, I've frequently said to students, I'd rather have my way than my say. There are times when we have to have our say and, you know, we have foot soldiers on the ground and they and our young people in our communities have righteously um, spoken up about the inequities and the injustices that they've seen. But there's also a need to be politically savvy to know when to speak, how to speak, with whom to speak, um, and how we help. Uh, we learn a lot of those lessons, as you said, Sonia, from our ancestors, from the ways that people made ways out of no way when they had even less uh, political um, um, acumen and, and access than we have now. And, and it's so important, I think as we are thinking about the strategies that we with community uh, share ways to get the work done. It is not enough to just hit the streets. It's not enough to be angry um, as, as much as I often am very, very angry and frustrated. That doesn't move the needle. So I so appreciate your bringing that forward. I wanna add something to the, um, your question, Keith, about um, what do we need to stay the course on? Um, and, and I'm going to point to one thing that, that I'm reminded of, you know, there are over the decades, there have been studies done by, uh, I would say, community centered applied research organizations on beat the odds schools, schools that do better by students of color than they are expected to, given the performance of students of color. And, and, and these, these range from organizations like NYU, to the consortium for school research in Chicago. Right? One of the things that always caught my attention in the Chicago research on Beat the Art School of Chicago was that the schools that did better were in poor communities that had social and cultural capital. They had cultural groups, faith organizations, recreation groups that were attached to and support particular schools. The same occurred in the study Annenberg did on beat the odds schools that served black and Latino males in Boston. There were these connections in those schools to community-based organizations that provided uh, supports to the school and to students and families for after school work, for cultural development and for economic development uh, as well. Um, and so one of the things that I, I think we need to emphasize and stay the course on is not, is not just to involve families in schools, 
uh, but to connect schools to communities to provide the important support students and families need for their academic, social, and cultural development both in school and outside of school. That emphasis leads to rethinking what we mean by community schools uh, and, and expanding support for that in a way that's systemic. Because at this point in time, those kinds of partnerships uh, are, are created by enterprising principals and teacher leaders and community leaders. They aren't negotiated and supported oftentimes by the system itself. And so mm -hmm. I think taking the notion of community schools and thinking about how to uh, implement it systemically uh, and equitably is, is something we need to stay the course on. Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in to share one other thought? And I believe that uh, my colleague who helped me in the work that we did in the Richmond Public Schools where, where we endeavored to be a beat the odds system Warren, as opposed to a, you know individual schools, that was our premise from day one. That we did not want to have boutique schools alone that were achieving at high levels, but our task was to make the district high achieving. And Dr. Yvonne Brandon is on the on the call. And one of the things that we realized and tried to address was um, the need to understand again the complexity of the challenge. That it's not just opportunities that have to be garnered. Um, it's not just innovation. We came up with five things, and I'm writing about that now, that beliefs have to be changed, that capacity for those who have to do the work has to be enhanced for every change that we want people to do, that we want them to make for everything that we want them to do differently. They have to have sufficient capacity and training to be able to do it well. But we can't forget that our core business is instruction. That was the third area, that everything that we do um, the wraparound services, the holistic education that we seek to provide is in service of ensuring that students get a stellar educational experience and come through that with the knowledge and skills that they need. The fourth issue that Yvonne and I prioritized was innovation because in our, in our sector, people are doing the same thing that they did in the 60s, the 70s. We, um, you know, getting people to give up what no longer works is really hard. As you mentioned earlier, Keith, what do we need to stop doing is just as important as what we need to start doing. And then the fifth issue that we addressed was accountability, that we all have accountability to our communities and our students. And what I'm saying is that it's not a simple, it's not simple that for us in Richmond, we were able to make the gains that we made by focusing on those five pieces simultaneously. Um, and um, I offer that for people to think about um, until I can get the book out um, so that they can begin to, to, to just prioritize all that has to be done and maybe use those five pieces as they're thinking about what they're going to do with this windfall of money that we're anticipating we're going to get. So I'm gonna shift us only one, because I often were part of these webinars and the moderator starts and says, we'll have time for audience questions and then we never get to it. So I do wanna shift to some audience questions because a few of those that have come in are, are I think pretty tied to the direction that the conversation has gone. In. And, and you just mentioned accountability, Deborah, uh, and, and not necessarily in the way that the question was framing it, but because you were, I think, using it more broadly about how do we keep ourselves accountable to what we're trying to do, keep ourselves accountable to the community. But I think the question raised, raised um, Oka Hansen asks, or it points out that the COVID sort of disrupts our current account accountability systems that rely so heavily upon standardized tests. Right, because we, right now I'm not sure how, how reliable standardized tests are going to be as measures. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that the systems have caught up to that yet. But I think that's the part of this question is how can we use the moment to engage communities in conversations about what a different approach to accountability could look like? And, and I'm wondering about, uh, uh, in line with this question, um, how do we center the kinds of outcomes that communities value, say they value, right? And what they want with community-based accountability of systems, right? Because if we're talking about systems change, how do we think about systems accountability in this community-driven way, right? Right now, Cycle's doing a project around community-driven equity indicators in Providence. 
the working with a research team of youth and parents to kind of determine the things that they would find important when it comes to educational equity. It's not a systemic project at the moment, right? It's this very small, tiny, how do we, how do we systematize community-based accountability? How do we build a policy, um, right? That, that might move us in that direction. Well, that's a wonderful uh, question because it, it dovetails with some work that's being led by the Partnership for the Future of Learning, um, funded by, to, to everyone's possible surprise, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, they've done a retrospective analysis of their own investments and standards assessment accountability and realize that they've been primarily top down, having listened to parents, teachers, and communities and students about the impacts of, of assessments on, on, on practice and performance, and also what kinds of assessment systems parents and communities would want to design to support the kinds of schools and, and recommendations that, that they've made. And so the partnership on, this, on the leadership of, 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 of Cyrus Driver and Mary Gonzalez are, are going to be looking at three to five communities and convening parents and practitioners in those communities to do interviews with them about you know, the history of standard assessment and its impact, but also given uh, where we are now, what kinds of assessment systems uh, would we want to build in order to improve practice rather than simply label, label it? Um, and so I think that's very promising. It represents an important shift. It, 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 it's a shift in the recognition that communities have expertise, right? The, the entire national agenda uh, over the last 30 years has marginalized communities with the argument that they're experts who know more. And as you know, Deborah seated at the pinnacle of expertise. It seems that, the, I'm sorry, I had to take that. I do that all the time, I apologize. Uh, it, it seems as if there's a recognition that experts don't agree on their expertise, uh, and you know their their plans uh, tend to not uh, be borne out when implemented locally, and so uh, there's an increasing call led by Nellie May, now echoed by the Gates Foundation, of convening students, practitioners, administrators, and, and advocates to learn the lessons from their perspective and to hear their their voices and amplify their voices, which will hopefully lead to a more bottom-up policy-making strategy than we've had in the past, which has basically been top-down with the down almost stopping at the state level or the level of municipal leadership, but not proceeding down to communities with the thought that communities don't know what's good for them or don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. Just one thought, Warren. Um, as I, I agree with you 100%, except on the part about Harvard being the pinnacle well, that, of knowing that's everything. That's not 100%. Else. Right? Not 100%. No, it, it's far from it. Um, you know, we are not the pinnacle. And no, with another conversation. Uh, <laughs> but um, I just hope that in as we're thinking about addressing systems change, that we don't go 180 in our strategy. There is much expertise in community. They need to, and, and those voices must be heard. They, they can't just be a part of the conversation. They have to be power brokers in that conversation. But there is also expertise from the academy. There's expertise from research. Um, and so I think one of our challenges is finding a way to um, make all potential collaborators in coming up with new ways of doing this work, valued, heard, and therefore incorporating all of that best thinking. Because what we again have done historically is we are either listening to community, you know, we had community-based schools in New York City, um, you know, we don't want any, um, you know, we're going to just put it all in the hands of community. That didn't work, and then we went back to top down. We don't have a good track record of calibrating and learning so that we can come up with some, some strategy uh, that really does the work that we need to do. I just want to make one point. Let's be careful about what we say didn't work. Uh, the, the decentralization in New York City, uh, a good colleague of mine wrote a wonderful it book about the history of that, was, was never fully implemented. Right? No. It, it, it started with all kinds of restrictions that would actually yeah. decrease the power of, of communities. But I just want to make, make that point. Just be careful because oftentimes what people will say is, oh, that didn't work. 
when in fact what they're not acknowledging is all the they didn't stay the course. Of, yeah, not, that was not the just stay the course. course and the they didn't actually sort of, implement it. Right. Yeah. Not, no, fully, no. not fully, um, not fully implemented. So what I will add to the, to the partnerships effort is we, we realize that uh, communities are, are actually have a lot of humility. Uh, when I've worked with community groups, community groups realize they need support from researchers, but they need support from researchers who will listen and learn, not researchers that come in with solutions that have been created prior to any conversations with communities. And so that's why I respect the work of Cycle and their partnership with Sphere. That's why I reflect the, the, the respect the work of what Sonia does. And that's why this Gates Initiative, we not only have uh, groups of communities, but we're going to have resource people meaning researchers uh, and, and policy makers who can inform the conversations and debate, but inform them based on the questions that are generated by the community, not simply the questions that researchers think are important to ask and answer. Yeah, I think I wanted to bring Sonia in and that, that last point, I think Warren does speak to the Burke report. And also Sonia, you earlier mentioned uh, sort of what we're potentially not drawing on or drawing from when it comes to thinking about our, our history and learning from civil rights movement and organizing, learning from other, other movements in terms of educational improvement um, and change. And there's, there is a question that came through that steers us in a different systemic direction or a question about systems that really is about integration. And that's another sort of, you know, major element or major effort of historic reform that we could argue, uh, you know, I think different people would argue we didn't stay the course with, or it didn't work, or it matters a lot, or it doesn't matter. I mean, you can find all the different people asking all the questions to your last point, Warren, right? Like giving us all the answers about how that is or isn't a focus that we should care about. But there is a question from Raquel Gonzalez that, that asks, um, that says, uh, I realize, integrated schools is not a silver bullet, right? But how do how critical do we um, see uh, school integration even across district lines um, and sort of gives the the anecdote that that their daughter is is now a fourth generation US Latina and across all four generations, parents, grandparents, great grandparents have attended segregated schools, right? And so where in thinking of our systems change conversation and accountability, all the different things, where does integration fit um, and how do you see that? And I think, um, you know, that they definitely drawing on sort of the black education tradition, there's, there's a lot of complex complexity to that question, uh, not to oversimplify to use, use our three S framework here. Well, as you, well, as some of you know, I have, I have um, written quite a bit about desegregation and integration and some of my opinions seem to be unpopular. Um, but I do think that it's important to really think about what issue we're trying to address um, rather than kind of jumping to integration as a solution. So even in terms of the question um, from Raquel about her daughter, you know, I guess I, an initial question that I have is, you know, what was negative about the experiences of previous generations that were um, in segregated schools, for example? Um, and in better understanding kind of what we see as the limits of segregated or racially similar or culturally specific education, depending on how we define it for certain groups. Um, I think it's just important for us to kind of figure out what is it about racially identifiable schools that make us uncomfortable and want us to address that. Um, I think that integration is evidence and an outcome of actually implementing what communities wanna see in their schools and that that will be a byproduct of the type of work um, that is actually committed to addressing what communities say that they need. Um, so I don't know if I should keep going, but again, I think it's more about listening to communities, uh, bridging the expertise of researchers and policymakers who respect their point of view, and then creating a school system that when it is inclusive and when it does actually have a curriculum um, and provides an experience that all students benefit from that we will actually end up with a system of schools that are integrated. So again, sometimes an unpopular view, but I think um, we have to do the work that it takes to create the beloved community that we want to mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. Just was thinking as you were saying that, Sonia, that 
it is, it'll always be a fight as long as integration is viewed as only benefiting people of color. When in actuality, integrated learning um, environments benefit all students. Um, our, our country is reluctant to realize that we are in a global environment, that we're not just competing against um, the town next door or a different state. And so for, for not just students of color, but non-students, I mean, non-white, um, non-student, you know what I mean, students who are not of color, also benefit from learning in environments that are multicultural. And um, I, I, so some of our efforts, I think, need to be uh, used to reshape the conversation so that it's not just about integrating for the sake of children of color, but integrating so that all children will receive. And that's a hard, that's a hard um, battle to fight. But in those instances where this, where the learning is stellar, where the school is stellar, white children are bought in on buses from all over the city. Um, so we can we know that we can make it happen. It's just a matter of figuring out strategies. I'll, um, I'll, I'll say something that, that this is a very complicated issue about integrated schools um, because we have to begin to unpack, as Sonia indicated, what are the dimensions that uh, of schools that we use or we, we say integrated school. Right. So one of the mentions that's actually, I think, positive is a multicultural environment. You know, um, get to experience kids from different cultural backgrounds as, as long as that experience is facilitated. You know, having been part of the first group that was integrated from East Harlem to um, uh, Yorkville on the Upper East Side, it wasn't facilitated. I had white kids feeling my hair. I, I was ashamed of, of my, the poverty of my community versus the economic resources of another. And I had teachers refer to us as the batch of kids, right? Uh, you know, on an individual level, some of the cultural experiences were good, but, but overall, uh, it had an alienating effect. Now, that's one issue that we have to think about. There is a promise of integration about, you know, we're all gonna be together, learn together, love together, respect each other, but that, that takes work and attention. It doesn't happen that magically. The second part of, of the integrated school is really problematic. Integration is often a proxy for schools that have more social, cultural, and academic capital because they've historically had more resources than the black and brown schools and schools in poor. So what you're doing with, with integration is simply getting a few more of the black and brown kids in the schools that you over-invested in historically, and you're still not fundamentally changing the quality of the schools that those kids have left behind. In fact, you might even be harming the quality of those schools by getting some of the kids who've had more resources because their families navigate into, into other schools and leaving a greater concentration of poverty in, in the schools that they leave behind. Uh, and, and so I think communities need to be much more systematic in their analysis of these factors and what they mean, what they're integrating and who they're putting the burden on for the integration. In Prince George's County, we created back in the 1990s and beyond, we created magnet schools, right? Uh, the idea was to integrate the schools by school. Well, the magnet school programs actually had more resources than the regular school programs. And who was overrepresented in the magnet school programs? The white kids who were bust into the schools so the schools could be integrated. Like what, what in the world sense does that make to take schools that are under-resourced, create a magnet program, give greater access to white kids to the magnet program, and then declare the schools integrated. Because on a school level, there are black, brown, and white kids in the same school, even though they're attending uh, very different kinds of programs, very different kinds, kinds of resources attached to them. I'll get off my yeah. soapbox, but as you can see, given my own personal experience and given my experience in working with districts on this, on this issue, it's much more uh, complex than we often yeah. um, discuss it to be. Yeah, yeah. So don't oversimplify, right? To to what what uh, Deborah told us, warned uh, about earlier. So you, we only have time, and I, you know, I'm loving the energy in the chat, and so I think just the 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 that's just great to see. Obviously, we won't get to 
um, all of these issues, but there is sort of a different kind of question that I've been getting pinged about that I want to just pose and they might, I don't know where it's going to leave us. It's not necessarily the best ending question, but I think it, it shifts us a little bit and challenges us to kind of name some things, which is, you know, uh, there is a strand of folks who want to say, you know, burn it, burn it down, right? We don't want this system. So we're talking about systems change. We just need, we need to get rid of it. It's not working or, you know, Deborah earlier, you said the sy systems are set up for the results that they achieve. So if the results that they're achieving are the ones that we're seeing, why are we tinkering? Right? Why are we Why are we talking about you know changing things within the current system, learning from past? But let's take it all down, rebuild. We need a whole new thing. Um, and I think there's a strand of you know we're talking about talking to communities. There's a strand of community activists who would who would hold that uh, sentiment, right? And a lot of young people are saying, "What I'm seeing, what I go to every day, you know, young people that we talk to." you know, it's, it's just not where it's not working. It's not worth going to. So I can't figure out what you're trying to tell me to do um, mm. to help change. So how do we address that? There is, there are these instances and plenty of examples of like utter failure on the part of the systems. And this idea that like, we need some kind of, we, we, we think we need one, some kind of system to, to kind of, to, to educate, right. Our, our people and, and in our community. So what do we do with that tension? And, and you know, we're, we're getting right at time. So I don't know if <laughs> one minute each for that. Very <laughs> I'll, I'll try to, I'll try <laughs> to stick to my minute. I think that we, the different ones of us have different roles to play. I am not of the burn it down mentality because of my strong belief that when the elephant fights the grass that gets trampled, that African proverb, when we burn it down, it's the children who, um, you know, will, just be destroyed by that. So I, I leave the fighting in the streets, the burn baby burn mentality to others. I think that there is a need for that. I truly do. But I also think that there is the need for uh, those of us who are so inclined in our leadership to work not just tinkering with change, but really trying to up, you know, just just change the entire system, which is what uh, we tried to do in Richmond. We achieved great success, uh, but it was a battle every single day uh, to do it. So I know that there will be people who join me in that kind of fight. You just, you muted yourself. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm kicking it over to Warren, who I view as a revolutionary. Sonia, <laughs> I view as an academic and a brilliant genius. But Warren, you're on the battlefield. Yeah, uh, so so I, I, I would say um, that what we want to do is reinvent and redesign and transform systems. But in order to get from what we have now to something new, we need scaffolds to support the transformation. Scaffolds for families, scaffolds for students, scaffolds for practitioners, right? If you tear down a building without a scaffold, you get rubble, right? Uh, that, that, and, and many people are trying to create rubble because the rubble is a wonderful excuse for privatization uh, and for the, um, the dismantling of community, quite frankly. If we're all just going to organize around individual schools, then we won't have a large enough, big enough voice to fight the big battles uh, and, and to form the coalitions to, for change. And so I think in each community, when you think about what the scaffolds are that we're going to build, we need to have some design principles for the system we want. We need to do an analysis of where the current system falls short and then think about the scaffolds that we need to build to get our students and families safely to the new system without abandoning them. Uh, I mean, Harlem is a good example of buildings that were basically abandoned for decades and decades and, and blocks were emptied out of families. And then what happened? Speculators came in, built in, and now we have gentrification. Wonderful new Harlem, but the people who should have been there to benefit from it weren't there because basically they dismantled entire neighborhoods to create a critical mass of space for the new community. We don't want that to happen in our urban systems. We need scaffolds to support families and communities as we develop design principles and build towards a new system. And I'll just so, say, you know, 10 years ago, I wrote a book called <clears throat> Learning in a Burning House and the house is mm -hmm. burning. And mm -hmm. some of us have to fight the system, but I think we all—it's also time to build a new house um, to extend mm -hmm. the scaffold metaphor. So I hope that that's mm -hmm. what we'll work on together. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone uh, who all the participants who joined us for this hour and for our panelists, right, obviously for engaging in what was a great, amazing conversation. We touched on a ton of topics in just under an hour. Uh, and uh, you've gotten credit for the fourth S, uh, Dr. Simmons, as scaffolds. So we now have a 4S framework to move forward with. Uh, and I just, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to interact and work with each of the panelists over, over my time in, in this work. And, and they're all just wonderful people on top of being brilliant scholars and activists and practitioners. Um, and I think what's amazing about them is they all hold those, those, those titles in different ways, right? They're not, you can't, you can't box these folks in. And I think largely that's what we need. We need people moving across spaces who can operate with communities in all these different ways. And you know, if we're going to build new systems um, from, from the ground up or from the scaffolding. And so I think I, I just wanna thank Nellie May for bringing us all together and, and offering these spaces. There are more upcoming spaces they're gonna be sharing out. So if you're not on the Nellie May mailing list, go to their website and get on it. You have to uh, be on the lookout for the next Ed Equity Talks event, which does feature someone who was named earlier, Alicia Garza on October 14th. Um, and uh, you got to get on their mailing list to be able to get that information. But I think it is my job to close us out. We are at 102 on my um, computer time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, have a good rest of your week. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, audience. <laughs>